Hello, this is a quick walkthrough video of our um, finding, implementing, and teaching OER workshop that we had on January 10th. I did not record the session live, so the teachers could have a chance to share their experience with OER openly. But here's a quick walkthrough video just in case you missed it and would like to learn more. So I started out by sharing my own personal story with OER. So I just moved from the Boston, New York area to East Tennessee in 1995. And I started working at a wonderful school that was doing some, what we would call an experimental design at the time. We were multi-age. So this, in this picture, I have bridging first and second grade students. I have, um, this school was a year round. So we're on a 45-15 calendar and we did not use any textbooks. And we took a, what we called a brain compatible project-based learning approach to teaching. And we did not do grades. So what we would be, what we call today equity or justice grading or ungrading. So we were kind of doing all these things in, in 1995 without really knowing, you know, that it was going to continue to become such a big topic in education going forward. So you can see there are some computers behind me. Um, and those are the three computers we had for the classroom. Um, and they did have internet, internet, internet access, but we were really just on the cusp of figuring out um, what we could get in terms of open resources. So um, I, we kind of bridge from that discussion to people who are in the working group with us. Um, what do they feel, what, what resonates with them when they think about OER? And I share these three memes. Most of the folks said they felt like A and B, where um, there's so much information out there now that it's hard to decipher what it is that they want to select. And then once you've found something, it, you celebrate. It feels like it takes forever to find the right lesson. But then what is it that you do with it? We had a couple people pick C. C is what, what I was thinking of is in the publication stage, you know, uh, people find OER and adapt it. And then they, we really should be publishing our adaptations, giving attribution to the person who created it, or for making our own OER. Um, we should, we should, we sometimes feel like it's not good enough. Um, and then there's this protectiveness, like why are you going through my stuff? So we talked about building confidence in that way. Okay. We continued the story for a little bit about how can we build confidence and feel that we're ready, we're ready for publication? How do we develop OER? So with all things in education, <clears throat> goals are often more achievable when you have a colleague that will work with you to develop things. And that relationship is really beneficial for all kinds of things, in particular development of OER. We know the brain's a pattern seeking device. We know that the brain looks for connections. So particularly when we can have interdisciplinary teams, then we're able to celebrate the accomplishments in around OER and the development of materials that en enhance that pattern seeking device in the brain. So talking about pairings of um, subject areas for critically important. And then we went back in time a little bit and talked about like what early versions of, of where, where teachers shared information. One was Mailbox Magazine, which is of course a paid subscription. So my school only got two per grade level and we had to like, you know, take turns with them. And then as I got a little longer in my career in the early 2000s, things and the internet continue to grow and access continue to grow. Repositories like Simple K-12 popped up with some OER materials and OER, uh, but then quickly found themselves um, with a, behind a paywall, so not truly OER. And then in my later years, before I started working at the school I worked at before I came here at Chat State, there was a wonderful local website. It's still, it's existing and very active called STEM Sparks, which were places where people put information. So as we think about the OER journey um, in our, um, our own lives and in, in our experiences as educators, things are beginning to open up. We still have repositories, but they're able to connect with each other. So you can find things quickly, like in a Google search. And I had to share 
where my OER work is now. So this is a group that I work with um, that grew out of my dissertation studies. That's community college math and biology faculty. And this is a gathering we had right before the pandemic broke up, but an in-person gathering that helped us break off into small groups to develop curriculum. Part of that group is being, it's being hosted by CUBES, which is a quantitative undergraduate biology group uh, with an online um, platform for meeting and hosting a curriculum that is um, published through OER Commons and gatherings of that are also into collections or published through OpenStax. But it really began with an organization called BioQuest Curriculum Consortium, which has been around for over 30 years. And so way back when I was beginning with OER, so were they. And this curriculum consortium was a way for them to pair professional development and curriculum design. So this is existing now. So if you're a math or biology faculty member, you can click on the link on the slides and see what wonderful materials there are. Um, okay, but OER in general, we know are open education resources. We know they're often that we have we should have digital access to them. They should they often contain multimedia pieces to them. They're downloadable. They're adaptable. You can make changes to them. Um, they're, they should be current. If you find an OER that you like and you want to adapt it, and then we talked about how you would um, go about publishing that to a place like OER Commons, getting a newer um, citation and attribution. Um, OER is public. It's available to anyone who can access it because it's openly licensed and it's free. And then I won't read the slide, but there's information here about how you can, um, some other ways you can think about OER beyond just a textbook. I also shared the five R's of OER. This is um, research that's been over the years related to OER. The five R's are what you'll find on TBR's website when you go to their OER section. Um, and it talks about how we retain or gather uh, and reuse OER and revise and remix it. The challenge I have with the five R's is I feel like, yes, that's a great acronym, but it may not really match up with the experience of what it's like as an educator to find and use and work with OER. So I, I call this the reality of OER. So um, if once you decide that OERs, open education resources are things that you would like to infuse in your classroom to do many of the wonderful things we talked about earlier in Convocation Week, like save your students money and increase access and equitability. We need time to hunt and gather OER. And we've talked over the last spring semester in our care workshops about universal design for learning and making sure that we select what we select is appropriate. We've even discussed different ways of thinking about grading. Um, but when we're that hunting and gathering piece of finding OER is time intensive, right? We're going to collect things. I recommend having things in folders or organizing ways where you'd like to look at things. And then we need time to review and select, right? We can't just gather things and then, you know, they can't, we, we can just gather things and have them sit in a folder. But at some point, we need to review and select things that we'd like to try in our classroom. And then this is the part where I feel like it's these these this part I think is really missing from the five R's is we don't adapt after we try only after we try we adapt before we try so when we find something that we think is a great lesson that we would like to do with our students we need we make some adjustments right away because. It's a very, it would be very unlikely for you, for you to find something that's absolutely perfect and fits every, your needs in terms of timeline, in terms of assessment. You know, we, we often find things that say, oh, this group, this, this, this lesson, they meet four times a week and they do this project for over 12 weeks. Okay, I need to think about this. My class is seven weeks. We meet two times in person. We meet one time online. How am I going to adapt it? But then we do implement it. We try it. And after that, there's a period of reflection, right? Teachers do this every day, all the time, ongoing, right? This isn't going as well as I thought it was, or this went better than I thought. Or I think next time, instead of doing this in groups of four, I'll do it in groups two. And we make, uh, uh, we make, we reflect and we adapt. And then we should be publishing our adaptations with attributions to the person who first created it. Um, or things that we come up with ourselves, 
we should be publishing and sharing it with others. That's the whole idea of OER, right? Is that what, and this is where it can get scary. Um, when we make something, we should be sharing it with others. And that, uh, that opens it up to judgment and other people seeing it. And that's where I think sometimes we, we fall off. So that's an area to grow. And we talked about, okay, I am ready to publish what I'm going to do. Where do I do that, right? There's so many different places. And some of our faculty on the call had participated in something, uh, developing OER with TBR. And it is on the TBR site, but where is it also, right? Now we know it's connected. For some folks, it was interesting to know that it's connected to places like Merlot, right? But um, I recommended that OER that is made is, is as a publication or a, a association with it to give yourself attribution um, and your, as you grow as a professional, but also to help others understand what pieces of your publication are, are adaptable. So um, creativecommons.org is one place where you can publish your OER that I really like because it has these six licensures associated with it. It gives me a DOI number or a publication citation attribution for my work. Um, and it also follow, helps me co collect a pattern of adaptation. So we spent some time talking about licenses and terms, which you can read and check out with the link on the slide. And then to show that it's really, really not all that scary because we do it all the time. We talked about how we do Amazon reviews. I shared this recipe from allrecipes.com and how it's rated and then gave um, some examples of ways that people have modified the recipe to make it better for them. So we can do it. We looked at an example on Merlot, which is one OER platform, um, and the link is there. We looked at we looked at um, one from an accounting class that has a game called Cribingo that it uses, and the person who designs it used it in terms for quizzing. We talked about, we visited the site, they have a five star system, and then they have peer reviewers that are, that are people that are educators that are that can be trained and paid to review curriculum and give it a peer review rating. And you can click on that and see what people said about the lesson plan as it was reviewed. And then there's just general reviewers, right? People who have tried it, just like people tried the recipes and offered a review. Then we explored three sites. So we took three minutes to explore three sites or one of three sites, whatever, whatever people had chose to look at. Merlot was one. And when we looked at the Merlot website, we saw that in my login, because they know I've created a login and I'm in Tennessee, that there's a right on the front page, a connection to TBR. We, um, I talked about how Merlot is a really great place to go to for any subject area. And um, if, if you're teaching humanities, there's quite a bit of things there. Um, and we talked about Oasis, which is my favorite. Um, but it is more heavily focused on the STEM fields. So um, it has wonderful, what I love about it has inter, uh, connections to interactive simulations for math and science, but there's also many other things there. But if you are in the humanities, you may have more luck with Merlot than Oasis. And then the other one was OER Commons, which has all kinds of things. But we looked at some of these pages and had connections and people share them out loud. So I welcome you to check those out as well. Then we talked about terminology, right? OER is a word that we've heard for quite a while for open education resources, but the language is shifting to open pedagogy, open education, open ecosystem, and open pedagogy model. It's not just the, the um, it's not, it's a movement from products and resources really to practices and people. And so an open pedagogy model, your students are also contributing to the content. So I shared what, um, because these terms are ones that I think you'll hear more and more often I, as, uh, as described as an open ecosystem, we shared what an open ecosystem is. Um, so OER, open education resources, open pedagogy. So your pedagogy of teaching that's contribute to, contributed to by um, materials that are used selected, OER materials, but also materials that are generated by you and generated by your students. Case studies are a great example. Um, open access publishing. So we are sharing our work with others 
openly, not outside of the paywall, increasing equity, but also giving our students a tough opportunity to do that. Using open source software. So like, for example, when I was in graduate school, the statistical software we use was very, very expensive. And luckily our college paid for our prescription through our student fees. But when we're doing things with our students, asking them to explore things, we can find open source software that they can use in many cases that are as equitable. For example, with statistics, working in R instead of SPSS. Um, open science. So instead of um, scientific research or study being confined to the people involved in the research and results being shared in academic journals behind a paywall, these science is shared openly through open access journals, but also in many different modalities like this blog posts and podcasts and uh, publications that are uh, white pages or one or two pages. So thinking about how do we communicate what we're doing to a broader audience in a more equitable way. Same thing with data. So in data, we have to we really want to focus on in an open ecosystem, equitable and culturally responsive engagement with data. So when we think about all the wonderful ways in our software presentation earlier yesterday about how we can, we can leverage information to serve our students better, we also want to be mindful of where does that data going and how do we communicate it to others outside of the school? We wanna say that we are doing these wonderful things at Chad State, and we've learned that they're wonderful because we're following this data and communicating it in the aggregate in a culturally responsive way. So open ecosystem increases access to that information while being mindful of it being culturally responsive. And that's the open education system. So this conversation around OER, developing to open pedagogy or open ecosystem are words that I think you'll hear more of. So thank you for your time.